The roundtable is here, former House Speaker and CNN's Crossfire co-host Newt Gingrich, Democratic strategist Donna Brazil, Bill Crystal, editor of the Weekly Standard, and my friend Alicia Menendez, host of AM Tonight on our sister network Fusion. Thank you all for joining us. I want to start with the big Supreme Court decision on campaign finance, erasing the overall limit on how much people can give during a campaign cycle. Donna, I know you think this is a really big deal. Tell me why. Uh, first of all, if you think money, uh, if you think money is speech and corporations are people and the wealthiest 1% are a persecuted minority in this country, then you'll love this. I Supreme guess you don't Court hold decision. those views. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I think it's a lousy decision for several reasons. One, the aggregate amount of money that, that wealthy individuals can give is, is now unlimited, pretty much. Uh, this, this allows people who basically can tell donors, and I'm sure the speaker can uh, remember these days, those days back in the past when people say, oh, I've maxed out. Well, now you don't have to max out. You can continue to give and give and give to as many candidates as you want. You still have an overall limit as to how much you can give, but the aggregate amount has changed. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the actual limits, as Donna points out, are there. I mean, is this really that big of a deal? I remember you used to well, say, I only had one billionaire supporting my campaign. Romney had a dozen. <laughs> but what, what, or, what, or 40. Or 40. Okay. <laughs> a few dozen. I mean, how, how big a deal do you think it, it is? It's a very big deal, first of all, because it does mean people can now give to scores of campaigns. So you're going to see a lot more financing. But it's part of a continuum. Started a long time ago when they said that that speech included money, which was the original decision. That you you as a billionaire or a millionaire could go out and spend your own money. By the way, do you then, buy that? I mean, just, I mean, to, of course, speech people. is money. I mean, every network loves the idea that speech is not money because then they dominate totally. But the fact is, the New York Times editorializes all day, every day, and doesn't count any of what it does as, as contribution. So speech speech matters. But what's happened is you've gone from that original decision to Citizens United, which said, uh, in effect, that corporations could give and created super PACs. Now you've said they're unlimited. The next step is the one Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, cited. Candidates should be allowed to take unlimited amounts of money from anybody, and you would overnight equalize the middle class and the rich. The problem today is Bloomberg can spend an extraordinary amount of money buying so, the mayor so, of New so York. So this is a middle class play to allow people to give as much money without any limits? <laughs> well, no, all the donors I know hate this decision, of course, because they used to, used to be a very good excuse to say to a yeah. candidate, ooh, I'm maxing out, I just can't help your campaign. It's good for the campaigns to get more money relative to the super PAC, so this decision will help in that respect. But I think it's constitutionally correct. I think what it brings home for me is the Supreme Supreme Court will be a big issue in 2016. We've all focused. Five, four decisions. Well, think of how many there have been, though. Yeah. Obamacare, yeah. same-sex marriage, now yeah. this. There could be decisions on Obama, so, and more Obamacare decisions coming, incidentally, I think, which, which could be interesting. So we all focus on foreign policy and Obamacare and domestic Supreme issues. Court. Supreme Court, the next president will shape the direction of the Supreme Court. And I think what the speaker said is the issue. This is a continuum. And here you have the Supreme Court coming down and basically giving you a very narrow definition of corruption, which is quid pro quo, whereas all of the liberal justices are saying, let's take a broader look at corruption. Does having money in the system corrupt the, system. Corrupt the actual system? And, and five that of the then, justices say no. Yes, and then that opens the door to a variety of other cases that we're going to see about limits to individual candidates, about limits to political parties. And once you've opened that door, it becomes much harder to close it. So, so, so Don, I, I want to ask you, the New York Times reported on Friday <laughs> yes. Uh, that Nancy Pelosi's fundraisers are already out in force uh, trying to take advantage of this ruling, hitting up donors who have maxed out, say, give more. Uh, isn't there some hypocrisy on the Democratic side well, of this? I mean, you guys are going to jump right into this. Look, I, I've always been for limitations in, in, with regard to campaign finance. And so, I mean, I'm sure there are Democrats who are going to take advantage of it, just like there are Republicans. If you look at the top uh, 100, uh, 1,000 1, donors from 2012, uh, over 650 were Republicans. So they're going to probably get more money out of this, but the Democrats are going to try to even the game, so to speak. Okay, now two of the most high-profile big donors are going big this week, we have learned, with a multi-million dollar ad campaign hitting vulnerable Democrats in the Senate. Here is an exclusive look, first look, at a new ad by a group funded by Charles and David Koch. The hypocrisy is shocking. Udall got campaign cash. Health insurance companies got billions of taxpayer dollars. And Colorado families are paying the price. Now Udall says... I would do it again, yes, I would do it again. So if there was any doubt, this erases it. The big issue still, the number one issue, dominant issue for Republicans this campaign, is going to be Obamacare. But, Bill, I've got to ask you, 
I mean, you got to give the president a little bit of credit here, right? 7.1 million signups after that disastrous start. They hit their they hit their number. They went past their number. The Rand Corporation says about 800,000 of those people were previously uninsured. 800,000 out of 7 million. The huge bulk of them previously insured. So, big deal. He moved people from insurance plans they liked to forces them into the exchanges. It's like saying, you've got to give the Soviet Union a lot of credit. 200 million people bought bread in their grocery stores. If it's the only place you can buy health insurance, they're going to get people to buy health insurance there. The debate is not over. The president tried to say this week, oh, the debate's over. No way. The Obamacare debate is real. But, you know, on that ad, which I like, actually, that's a response to the ads attacking the Kochs, obviously. But it's also an attempt to tell Republicans, you do not, don't let them tie you into the insurance companies. That's been the, the best Democratic talking point in response to the failure of Obamacare is the Republicans want to go back to the old system, the pre-Obamacare. So the, uh, and there, I think they need to have an alternative to answer that. And the Republicans are in the pocket of the insurance companies. Those ads say, no, the Democrats actually, so, the Obama administration worked with the well, insurance companies to write let's, this let's bill. Let's imagine an alternative reality where he had not pulled that rabbit out of that hat and crossed that seven million threshold. We would all be sitting here talking about how this was a big disaster and it was a failure. So of course he's going to spike the ball in this. He has to. I think it's more interesting that you have congressional Democrats not doing the same, wanting to see, A, how many of these people were not previously insured, wanting to see how many of them actually come through and pay their premiums, especially because we've focused on this number when what really matters is what this risk pool looks like. How many young and, what's and healthy... What's your sense? How many young people are I think you're going to get... Us yet. We do not know the numbers, but... From the data that we do know, it will be close to 30 percent, which is sort of on par with where Romney Care was when it came to these young, healthy people that you need in the risk pool in order to balance out those who need care, bring the rates down for 2015. Okay, let's move now, abrupt turn to Afghanistan, where historic day, voters are making a critical decision this weekend. Who will replace President Hamid Karzai? ABC's Mohammed Leela is tracking the latest from Kabul. Mohammed? Good morning, John, and a historic moment here in Afghanistan. Now, there were fears of violence, especially after two Western female journalists were attacked just the day before the election. But in the end, this was a huge defeat for the Taliban because, quite simply, despite their threats, they couldn't stop this election from going forward. Key in all of this for the United States, unlike President Hamid Karzai, the three leading candidates all say they want American troops to stay in this country. Just a short time ago, we spoke with Ashraf Ghani, who many say is the front runner. Would American troops be welcome in Afghanistan? They will. The overwhelming number of them are going to be helping train and equip Afghans. And right now, the vote counting is underway, a process that could take weeks. So it could be quite some time before we finally find out who the next Afghan president is. John. Thanks, Mohammed. Now to the other big foreign policy story this week. Secretary of State John Kerry's sharp dial back on the Mideast peace process. Check him out with Martha Raddatz here three months ago versus what he is saying now. Hopefully the leaders will seize this moment and, and at least move the balls forward somewhat. There are limits to the amount of time and effort that the United States uh, can spend if the parties themselves are unwilling to take constructive steps in order to be able to move forward. It sounds like he's basically declaring defeat. You know, this is one of the goofiest things historians will someday record. You have the leader of the Palestinian organization saying in Arabic, we're never going to recognize a Jewish state, period. Now, you couldn't have it clearer. There is no peace process. There has not been a peace process ever. The core movement is committed to the destruction of Israel. Hamas is committed to the destruction of Israel. And yet Western diplomats have this passion, this endless need, this masochism. Please, and it's bipartisan. Please well, let I me mean, come I, over. I, I seem to recall quite an effort even under both As President I just Bush's. said, yep. yeah, it's, bi it's a bipartisan State Department-led fanaticism with allowing people to beat on you so you can come back and say what, what you just saw, which is if this was a comedy show, Kerry would win an award for a comedic performance. Just put those two things back to back. This is the big moment. We're here forever. Three months, three months in history. Three months later, well, we have limited patience. Well, the Middle East has unlimited patience, and that means people with limited patience so, lose. So, Donna, was, was there a little <clears throat> bit of a White House pullback on this? I mean, I, we looked at this. John Kerry has been on the road 169 days as Secretary of State. Right. 54 of those days have been in the Middle East. Well, because I think the White House, like previous White House, their uh, uh, administrations, they're trying to achieve a goal that is, 
you know, uh, the speaker just said it's it's very difficult, very tough. If if you have one side uh, that will not give up its demands, uh, although Israel has has given up land, it, they've released prisoners. You know, Mr. Abbas, you know, he's like, no, I'll go to these international organizations. I'll get recognized. The only way he's going to get the only way that there will be a two state solution if, is if the Palestinians come to the table and deal with the Israelis. And if they won't do that, then it's, it's tough to get a two-state uh, solution. But I, I applaud the administration, and I applaud Secretary Kerry for trying. And quickly, Bill, this is the end of the peace process. I mean, the it's like a zombie. It just keeps coming back keeps because back. American administrations like the idea. Of, they, they are obsessed with the notion that if only the Israelis and Palestinians would work out their problems on a few square miles of the West Bank, where incidentally nothing much is happening, where it's totally quiet, that then they don't have to focus on where the, everything, where 150,000 people are getting killed, like in Syria, where Assad is still in power.